my favorite lifetime was I was a nebula, you know, which is just a gaseous entity, you know, out in space. And I could feel me spread out over space. And, you know, I was watching from inside the universe. I was watching everything that was going on in the various solar systems. And, you know, it was just cool. Hello, Nancy. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited that you wanted to come on to the show because I've heard parts of your afterlife experiences and they are quite extraordinary. Like I've actually never heard anything similar, which is also interesting because a lot of these NDEs are very different, but it seems like your experience is so extensive. It's so rich and you got so many questions answered. And I'm really curious to dive into everything today or as much as we can. But what I'm curious about first is how was your life prior to these near-death experiences? Were you religious at all? Were you spiritual? How was your life like? I was, at the time that I died, I was an attorney. I had been reared as a Roman Catholic. So I had see, 16 years of Roman Catholic education and then six more years of Methodist college. So I was a Christian. You know, I didn't believe everything that the church um, told me because I didn't believe in bigotry, <laughs> but um, I was also spiritual. I did a lot. I was a seeker, you know, one of those people that, you know, reads a lot. And, and back then we, we didn't have YouTube or, or even much in the way of an internet. Um, so I didn't have that as a source, but I read a lot. And I really wanted to know the answers to my questions. You know, I was really kind of desperate to know the truth. And at the time that I died, I was had been practicing law for 16 years in a 270 attorney law firm. We had um, one of our partners had developed breast cancer. So my partners decided to have a mobile mammography unit come to our parking lot and any woman in the firm could go out and have a mammogram. So that's what I did. And that's how I found out <laughs> about breast cancer. I was scheduled for surgery. And before the surgery, uh, I had a radiological procedure. It's called a needle localization procedure. There are two ways for a breast cancer surgeon to know where to cut. One is if you can feel a lump, then they you know, feel the lump and cut around it. The other is if there's no lump to feel, they use uh, a mammogram machine and stick a big wire into your breast inside of a needle and stick the needle in and put the needle and wire as close as they can get to the tumor. So I had three tumors. So it took, gosh, like about an hour and 15 minutes um, to do this procedure. It had to be done twice. And as a result of the procedure, I died. I had a severe allergic reaction and very low blood sugar. And my heart was just racing, 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 racing. And it was, I couldn't get my breath. It was beating so fast. And then it stopped. And I was relieved because I wasn't panicking anymore about my heartbeat. I didn't realize it had stopped like for good. But that's how I died. And over into the afterlife. Wow. All right. So, uh, so, okay. So you were a spiritual seeker, uh, being a lawyer also. Uh, and then I'm curious, all of a sudden you go in to have this check, not expecting, you know, to have cancer. Um, uh, some people who have interviewed sometimes have a premonition that something is going to happen uh, before they have an ND. Did you have sort of a premonition that, you know, this will, something will happen now or where you're like, I'm just going to have a test and this is going to be okay. And not only did I not have a premonition, I didn't know I was dead for like a good part of the beginning of the experience. 
I had no idea I died. So. Oh, wow. All right. So how is that possible? <laughs> uh, is that because like it looks so like where we are right now? Because, you know, I've never been dead. Yeah. I, I have in, <laughs> in between lives, but not as Janneke. So I, I can't imagine it. I, after I left my body and I went into blackness and I saw this pinpoint of light in the distance, I thought, oh, I know what this is. I'm supposed to go into the light. So I, as soon as I thought go into the light, it came at me. And I spent a lot of time by myself in the light. So there wasn't anything to see or hear. It was just light. And, you know, I felt that tremendous love and, and acceptance, total unconditional acceptance as, long, as well as the love just going through me. And then things just started popping into my head. And I was trying to diagnose, like I knew I was alive. And see, I, I hadn't lost a single moment of life going from you know, sitting in the mammography room to being in the light. I was aware of every single moment. So I was trying to make a medical diagnosis of what, what had happened and where I was. And then all this information just started coming into my mind, like, dropping into my mind, kind of like a download to a computer, only much, much faster. All the answers to all those questions that I'd always wanted the answers to. Um, and a lot of topics that I didn't even know I was curious about. I mean, it's just tons and tons of information. The biggest um, amount of information had to do with humans and what humans are like and the fact that we the personality, the individual, the, the person that you know yourself to be is not the body. It's the soul inside the body. So I was given a lot of information about that and how, you know, I'm an eternal being. I'm not a human animal named Nancy. So after I you know, was getting all this information, I also got other spiritual abilities that humans can't do. And so I was playing around with those. And with one of them, I could see through the back of my head. And I saw down below me somewhere, I saw Nancy sitting in the mammography room with the, the wire sticking out of her breast and hospital gown on. And I didn't recognize her. I, I remember looking at her and thinking, huh, I wonder what all that vanity was about because you don't look so hot now. And... That was the only thing that I saw. But when I saw that, I thought, nah, I couldn't have died. I mean, I'm still alive. You know, I, I'm more alive than I've ever been in my whole life. Um, but that's when I started, you know, thinking, you know, what's going on here. And I saw a tunnel. Like I was thinking to myself, well, if I was, if I died, I should have gone through a tunnel to a light. And I didn't go through any tunnel. All of a sudden, I'm in a tunnel. And it wasn't, you know, like the celestial, you know, full of light and angels and loved ones. I get dirt. I get a dirt tunnel uh, with rock sides that looked like my railroad trestle had a just barely paved road through this railroad trestle tunnel. And I said to myself, I know I'm in the light. I'm not in this tunnel. You know, this isn't fooling me. And I go, fooling me? How can life fool me? Because that tunnel was every bit as real as anything Nancy had ever experienced. So I decided as the attorney, I'm going to get more evidence. So I conducted two experiments to see if, if I just thought a word, if it would materialize around me, just like human life. And it did. I did that twice more. And that's when I figured out I must have died without going through a light or without going through a tunnel to the light. Um, do you want me to go on? Because I have lots more. 
<laughs> yes, I know. There's so so much to the story. No, I, I'm just uh, amazed uh, and how all these experiences are so different and so unique. Uh, I've interviewed quite a few people about near death experiences, and uh, yeah, and I, I think we all, perhaps I don't know. Do you think we we receive exactly what we need? That it's that God or the universe gives you exactly what you need to have as an experience to grow, to expand. I have been researching this. You see, my uh, first afterlife visit was in 1994. And, you know, when I started telling people about it, when I joined IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and I started telling people about it, I realized, hey, I'm the only one telling this kind of a story. Um, so I started researching. And what I have learned from reading thousands of afterlife experiences is that somewhere around 97, 98% of souls that do actually go into the afterlife, you know, they go through the light or they go through a dark space or they, they somehow get into the afterlife. They have experiences that are crafted uniquely for them. It's just like you said, you know, it's manifested by the soul and by other souls in the afterlife to give a soul the greatest comfort possible. Because, you know, a lot of people know they're dying or they know that they've died or they've been in severe accidents or, you know, it's extremely traumatic. So the afterlife process, the crossing over process is designed to bring comfort and to give each person exactly what they need to ease the trauma and to help them accept, you know, what's going on. But then there's a small group of people like me, maybe I haven't come up with an exact percentage yet, maybe 2% who recognize the process. You know, like when I saw the lie, I said to myself, oh, I know what this is. This small group of what I call deep afterlife experiencers, our experiences are consistent. We all experience about the same thing. We use different words to describe it, but it's a very different experience than the 97% or the 98% of other afterlife experiencers. I call those threshold afterlife experiencers. Wow. And I don't, I don't know what determines, you know, which type you have, um, right. but the deep after experiencers don't hit a barrier. We generally don't see loved ones. We don't have guides. We don't have, you know, any of the elements that um, is typical for a near death, for a threshold near death experience. Um, so, do you mean that um, with a barrier? What do you mean by that? Do you mean that you, you don't have like a choice to come back, or is that what you mean? Oh no, you always have a choice. Um, a lot of, uh, well, actually, most. Uh, near-death experiences that I've read, afterlife experiences that I've read, the accounts say that the soul reached a barrier or a boundary or some place where they weren't allowed to progress further. Right. Or somebody, some loved one told them, you know, it's not your time, you know, you have to go back. Or they're actually pulled back into their body by resuscitation efforts of medical professionals. Or they decide on their own that they don't want to leave children, spouse, you know, parents. Um, so they, they reach a point where they, they go back. Deep afterlife experiencers generally don't reach a point where they can't go any further. They, we go all the way to merger with the source. Um, and there are a few that, want to come back you know they they get all the way <laughs> all the way through the process um and have resumed eternal spiritual life um but they still want to come back for one reason or another unique to them um wow. but some of us are just we're there and then we're back <laughs> you know with not really it doesn't seem like it's our choice i think it is because before i came back into nancy's body i kept saying Somebody's got to tell those people down there all the stuff that I'm learning, all the all these things that are happening to me. Somebody's got to tell them, 
And the next thing I know, you know, I'm on my way back into Nancy saying, I didn't mean me. I didn't mean me. Okay, so it's interesting, Nancy, because we're having some technical issues today with our microphone and sound. And you just said before we came on here that uh, that usually happens when people have near-death experiences. Is that because the energy is so intense or so high or that you bring a lot of energy with you? <laughs> yes, it, our energy uh, interferes with electronics. I know some near-death experiencers who can't wear watches um, because of the interference and... I, there have been grocery stores and bookstores I've walked in and their computers went down. And as soon as I walked back out, their computers came back up. So it's just. Very fascinating. <sighs> yeah, we just have to live with it and accept what is right. I mean, we can't control the, the tech stuff. And I'm just like thinking that I need to send positive energy to our tech stuff because it's sort of alive in a way. I believe that. But back to what you were talking about, it's really interesting because I've never heard that, uh, that some have experiences where they go deep into the afterlife uh, and come back with a mission. And I know that, um, I mean, you've written five books. Uh, I know you have a great mission and that there even was a council or your council that said you hadn't done your work good enough, so <laughs> you really needed to step it up. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So I would love for you to continue uh, sharing what happened after you went through the tunnel. Uh, I think that's where we, we left off, that you went through the tunnel. Yeah, once I, I realized that I died, you know, by having these various it, manifesting, and that's the word that came to me, is that I manifested these real earth-like environments myself just by thinking the word that seemed to be like a an opening uh, for me to realize i was dead because then i saw five glowing energy beings you know kind of like right to my left and they were just you know kind of shaped like this and they glowed from inside and they were my deepest dearest, most beloved loved ones from all eternity. And I hadn't incarnated with any of them ever. They weren't anybody from Nancy's family. And I had a lot of, well, my father had died. I had a sister had died, grandparents. You know, I had a lot of deceased loved ones in the afterlife. I didn't see any of them. I saw these five light guys that were my best friends. And they were so happy to see me. And they were laughing at me. They said, you know, but tell us everything. We thought it was just completely ridiculous that you volunteered to go into human life because you make a terrible human. And so you got to tell us everything. So then I went into a life review. And so Nancy's life played out uh, all the scenes from her life, like not in linear fashion, but just scenes like on this huge bubble that was around me. And the scenes were just like, you know, floating all around. And one of my light being friends was right beside me inside the bubble and the others were on the outside. And the ones on the outside were popping into Nancy's life and living it as Nancy or as them. And they kept doing that over and over. And while that was going on, you know, I saw little bits and pieces of that after life, um, life review. Um, and I realized that Every single moment, every thought, every feeling, every idea, every imagination, everything is recorded by the soul and it's played back in that life review. Well, but while that was going on, I saw all these hundreds or maybe even thousands of other physical lives that I had lived throughout you know, my eternity all over the universe. And so I was just far more interested in, you know, watching this. And I remembered every single moment of every single one of them all at the same time. And I said to myself, how could I possibly have forgotten all this living and all of what went into making me who I am? And it was all there. And I, I don't know what happened to my light guys who are watching Nancy's life because I totally lost interest in that. But shortly after that, I started realizing that, you know, these, these downloads of information were coming to me again and that I could focus my attention on 
what I wanted to know about. I didn't have to just sit there and let it all drop in. So I asked my biggest lifetime questions. What is God? What am I? What's the purpose of life? Why am I on earth? Where's heaven? Where's hell? And what's the one true religion? And I asked the one about religion because I had been raised as a Catholic and we were always told that's the one true religion. And I got the answers all at once. It, in complete understanding, I call it knowings. It's where everything that could possibly ever be known about a subject and all the feelings and emotions and the sensation, the firsthand living it, all drops into your mind all at the same time. And it's all understandable all at the same time. But when I got those answers, I was angry because you know, the information about what God is and what I am and the purpose of life and all that was completely different than anything I'd ever learned at, you know, growing up as an old Catholic girl. I took it personally. You know, I, I said to myself, you know, why, why didn't I know this before? Did everybody know this but me? You know, did my, did the nuns and the priests think I was too stupid to understand this? You know, I mean, I, I took it personally. I thought, they didn't trust me enough to tell me the truth. And here I'd gotten the truth in the afterlife. And in response, I think to my anger and to kind of calm me down and also to show me that it wasn't personal, I saw the entire history of earth with a focus on how religions originated and how they developed over the ages. And I saw earth's past, earth's future, creation of the planet, the whole nine yards. And that did calm me down. Because I saw that, you know, religions, religious people and spiritual people, they're not lying to us. They're telling us the best that they know. It's just that it's human speculation and myth and not the truth that we deep afterlife experiencers get when we're in the afterlife. And I assume that the, the answer was not that, yes, now you're going to hear what's the main religion. <laughs> <laughs> the answer I got was no religion is a true religion. They all have a kernel of truth within them, surrounded by layers and layers of myth. Right. All right. So, wow. I mean, you downloaded all this information. Um, I'm feeling it's going to be lots more books that you're going to write. It seems <laughs> like, I mean, you know so much. I, I, yeah, we'll, we'll get to how it's like being you now, like living with all this knowledge. But I'm curious, did you have a feeling of where you were? Uh, like in my mind, I'm picturing you flying around. Like I get pictures when I, I listen, like, you know, almost like the spirit with no body. Did you feel that you have your, your body, a sense of a body or something physical? And was there a landscape there? No and no. Um, I don't remember exactly. I think it was when I was first in the light. And I, I realized I could see through the back of my head that I realized I didn't have a body anymore. The afterlife is not a physical place. It doesn't exist anywhere in the universe. In fact, the universe exists inside of Source's mind, as does the afterlife. Everything is inside of Source's mind. So in the afterlife, it's a, a state of, it's a mental life an emotional life. It's a state of being, a state of existence, a state of awareness with no physical matter at all. So there's no body, no scenery. It's living in your head, kind of, you know, the closest thing that I can think of in human life to it. Hmm. Really? <laughs> but how, how do you know what's going on in your head is really amazing. <laughs> 
Huh. Okay. Because uh, I've heard, that's interesting because I've heard many other are speaking about that they felt so real that they could think about something and it, it appeared and it felt really physical, like even more physical than this world. Yeah, that's manifesting. That's what I did when I created the railroad trestle tunnel. And after that, I created a, med a meadow and then a hospital corridor. What I call threshold near-death experiences, threshold afterlife experiences, do manifest things just like Earth life while they're in the afterlife because it's, it's part of what will comfort them. You know, who wants to go someplace it's a complete shock and a complete surprise and you don't recognize anything and you don't know where you are and you don't have any loved ones there. Nobody wants to go there uh, unless you unless you are prepared for it and you, you know to expect it. So most afterlife experiencers manifest the appearance of loved ones to comfort them and of physical environments. That's their idea of what heaven would be like. Mm -hmm. If they had stayed longer, those physical appearances would have disappeared. Okay, so um, would that mean that I'm just trying to understand from my perspective, you know, my limited perspective as a human, uh, that you are in this um, uh, nothing place in a way where everything is created. So you felt yourself as a creator, uh, creating things like, uh, because everything is potential, I've heard that the universe is a big place with energy and potential uh, and that when we w have a wish or we want to create something, then that potential becomes alive. So were you sort of in this realm of potentials? No, that, that description really does apply to threshold afterlife experiences. Um, and, and that's why that perception persists. I mean, 97% of the people who go to the afterlife tell you the same story. You can create whatever you want using your mind. But those are the people whose time to die hasn't come, and they, they are returning to human life. They're not going to live in the afterlife. And so they, they literally manifest. Manifest means create physical reality while they're in the afterlife to comfort themselves. After the life review, like if you if you stay in the afterlife, like I did, um, you have a completely different experience. You realize, like I realized, that that tunnel and that meadow and that hospital court was not real. We realize human life is not real. We realize that we are spiritual we're energy in fact every afterlife experience deep afterlife experience that i've read the the soul realizes that god what i call source is this huge energy field and that all of us and all of the universe and all of everything makes up that energy field so that we what we call soul inside these bodies is actually God. Right. Look, looking out through our eyes and experiencing physical life through us. So we realize that human life was just like a role that we played in a, in a, in a Broadway show. Um, and that who we really are, our consciousness, our self-awareness is source. And so all that need to manufacture, you know, physical environments and have bodies and, the, you know, all that desire to have those things drops away. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, this is new to me. I, I'm like <laughs> expanding my awareness now. I'm feeling I had, you know, sort of a picture of this. And now <laughs> that was well, like... But this is yeah. super interesting. I love this. My, in my sixth book, you know, my these five books just document what happened to me and what I learned in the afterlife. They're not autobiographies. There's nothing in there about my early life or, you know, what things were like after I got back. It's just the information that I remember. My sixth book is about these deep afterlife experiencers and 
what we what happened to us and what we learned in the afterlife and how it's different than the 97 percent of you know right. experiences that everybody knows about I would researchers to... yeah researchers ignore us because we we don't fit in the in the pattern they want you know consistency and, and a pattern they want the the, uh... the the biggest part of the bell curve you know bell curve where you know most things fit they ignore the ends and deep afterlife experiencers are on on the end they're outliers that makes sense. I would love for you to come back on the show and then I'll read your <laughs> book. We can go into that. So um, okay. I'm curious. There's so many ways to go here, uh, but I'm su super curious. You remembered thousands of lives. Were there one or two lives that just stood out that you were like, yes. oh my goodness, how cool to have experienced that? What if yes. humans do? Yeah. <laughs> my, my favorite lifetime was I was a nebula, you know, which is just a gaseous entity, you know, out in space. And I could feel me spread out over space. And, you know, I was watching from inside the universe. I was watching everything that was going on in the various solar systems. And, you know, it was just cool. And then my second favorite one was um, one that, later interfered with Nancy's life, uh, I was a shuttle pilot. I was uh, some kind of a, what humans would call an alien being. I had um, like kind of moist, shiny, scaly skin and ri coronal ridges you know, over my head. It reminded me a little bit of a Klingon, you know, from Star Trek. Um, and I had two sets of eyelids, one went that way and one went this way, and my irises were orange. But anyway, I was a space shuttle pilot, and my job was to take um, supplies and goods and things from a space station and fly them in a shuttle out to the big spaceships that were too big to dock at the spaceport. So I would just, you know, all day long, I'd just fly, you know, goods from the space station out to the spaceships pick up whatever they had that they wanted to leave at the space station, fly that back. Well, after I get back into Nancy's body, uh, I didn't have a fear of heights anymore. So I took flying lessons and I had the darnest time trying to learn how to properly land an airplane because I wanted to come in and drop down to the ground and then just scoot along like a shuttle <laughs> and out in space. And my flight instructor kept telling me I was going to kill myself doing that. Um, but that's the only only lifetime I can think of that has really interfered with living now. That's fascinating. That's and that's fun. That. I think you're really brave. That's really cool. <laughs> that's really cool. Okay, so you had a lot of questions. I, I can identify with that. You know, a part of me was like, I wish I had the same experience, you know, because uh, I have so many questions to ask God. Um, could you uh, share with us, uh, if it's not private, uh, what the answers were to, and what were your most pressing questions, uh, if you would like to share, and what was the answer from source? Well, the, my first book is the, the seven questions and the answers I got. Um, plus a section on what what source showed me was a better way to live. You know, when I was watching that history of Earth, you know, and I saw the future, I was given answers to you know what's a better way to 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 live life. But the seven questions were: Who is God? Who am I? What's the purpose of life? Why am I on Earth? Where's heaven? Where's hell? And what's the one true religion? So, who is God? Is this infinite energy field with um, that, that's alive. It has personality and character traits. One of those character traits is a sense of humor. So that's where we get it is, you know, God has a sense of humor. Who we are, are, there's no good term for it. It's kind of like a book character in a, in a novelist's mind um, or a dream character in our own mind. Source wanted to know what it was like to relate to somebody else. And there wasn't anybody else, it was just source. 
So in order to have someone to relate to and also to find out what different things felt like that it could imagine but couldn't directly experience itself because it's this huge energy field. It imagined the universe and it sent out this bolus of mental energy kind of like what we call the big bang and watched that energy evolve over time into the various stars and the planets and you know galaxies and everything and it imposed um like laws what we call laws of nature you know like gravity and molecular cohesion and chemical reactions and you know things like that on this energy so that it would have you know processes and protocols to follow as it evolved and then it created these mental characters each has a unique personality composed of some of source's own character traits and then other character traits that source can imagine but doesn't personally have and then he it source puts those characters mental characters inside of physical world it's very much grander but on kind of very much like our dreams you know in our dreams we create a dreamscape source has the universe we create dream characters source has all the creatures and things in the universe we put ourselves into one of the dream characters and experience the dream from inside that character and we relate to other dream characters you know we have this little story going on and we experience it from being inside one of those characters the well, source puts itself into all the people and all the animals and all the plants and all the things throughout the universe and experiences physical life from inside all those things just like we do our dreams the purpose of life is to gather experiences for source it's just to fulfill that that you know job of living it's just to live and when we're not you know fulfilling our particular purpose like we all pick a um, like a theme to study uh you know some kind of aspect of physical life that source can't experience directly and we pick that to observe or to experience all through the universe but when we're not experiencing that particular thing that particular character trait the rest of it's supposed to be fun so that's the purpose of life, it's just to gather experiences for source. Why am I on Earth? Because I chose to be. I, I learned going back in 1994 that I volunteered to come into physical life at this point in time because Earth was going through a tremendous transition. Um, and, you know, we see it on the news every day. I mean, you can't help but notice that, you know, tremendous things are happening to the earth and to the people on it. And so a million of us volunteered to come into earth and try to help with that transition. I had not been incarnated for, you know, what would be thousands and thousands of human years. Where's hell? There is no hell. Source created the entire universe in its mind. It did not create any kind of hell or any kind of punishment or any kind of Satan or demons or evil or, or anything like that. Um, there's no reason to. And I find that from my readers, that's one of the hardest things to accept is that there's no punishment. But every afterlife experiencer that I have read or heard who had a deep experience and had a life review will tell you there's no judgment. You know, nobody in the afterlife is going to say, oh, you know, you, you done wrong. You need to be punished for this. Um, that's a human desire to punish, to get revenge. That's an animal trait. And we don't have those traits once we leave these bodies. We are no longer human once we leave these bodies. Um, so we're seven, we're seven. And then the one true religion I already answered. So those are the answers. Very, very interesting. Uh, all right. So uh, how did this uh, afterlife experience uh, end? And did you feel like you were there for a long time? Did you have a sense of time? There's no time, but I 
I went through several stages of afterlife. And I think part of that was because I wasn't buying it. You know, I wanted proof. I mean, I knew what I was being told and what I was living was true, but I wanted evidence. I wanted proof. You know, I, I wanted to be convinced. And so it took a lot of convincing. <laughs> I'm a real slow learner um, sometimes. But so after after I had this, you know, review of Earth's history and future, I started going going with my five closest friends and I started merging into them one at a time. They told me that in order to awaken a source, I had to get used to the idea of being more than one. And so I spent a lot of time practicing, you know, merging my energy into their energy and then living their physical lives the same way they had popped into Nancy's life when they were on the outside of the bubble of my life, of Nancy's life review. I was popping into their lives and I could live scenes from their physical lives, either as them or as me. It was the wildest thing. I mean, just, I, I could never have conceived of such a thing myself. And so I got good at merging into one. So then I did two and I did three. And eventually I could merge into all five of them at the same time. And that feeling of being a collective being or collective entity or collective mind or, or person or you know whatever you want to call it, is what source was like. So I went on and I was going to wake up, you know, merge, you know, remember that I was source. And on the way, I got to watch creation. I watched creation of the universe and I lived it moment to moment as it, and I remember doing it. I remember being source and creating the universe. I mean, how mind blowing is that? And after I watched the creation of the universe and remember doing it, I remember why I realized, oh my God, I did this to myself. I created this life as Nancy myself. I've never been alone. I've never been unloved. I've never been out there with no resources. I've never been cast adrift. I've never been held to having to meet, you know, Catholic Church rules and regulations. I have always been source, and I chose this for myself. And at the same time that I realized that I was source and that I I wanted this for myself. I wanted Nancy's life to experience it. I was still saying in the back of my mind, somebody ought to tell those people. You know, somebody's got to tell those people down on earth. And that's when I, that's how I got back into Nancy's body. I just kind of was put in this whirlwind, you know. I mean, it was literally whirling around like a, hurricane or cyclone or tornado or something. And I was going down this funnel back into Nancy's body and my five light being friends were all around me saying, love is all that matters. Love is all that matters. And I was saying, shut up. I'm trying to remember all this stuff that I learned here. And I was like cramming for a final exam, you know, memorizing as much as I could while they're saying love is all that matters. And I finally get down to Nancy's body and I wouldn't go in. I did not want to go in. And I was like forced in. And it felt like sticking myself into this cold, wet, heavy, dead clay. <laughs> and even when I was inside, I fought, you know, spreading out inside this lump of gross flesh. And, but I slowly percolated. And see, that's the, another interesting thing about cells. It's percolated all through every cell, every molecule of the body. It's everywhere. So I started slowly percolating back into Nancy's body. And when I got far enough that I could see through her eyes, you know, we can see without physical eyes. We see much, 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 much better without physical eyes. But when I could finally see through Nancy's eyes, I saw the, the radiologist and the radiology technician at the back of the room looking at the mammography films. And I said, 
I passed out. And so they came over to find out what had happened. So that's how I got back. Wow. Um, <laughs> were you clinically dead? Yes. Um, nobody declared me dead because I was alone, but my heart stopped. And at the time that the radiologist and radiology technician, you know, came over to check on me, my blood pressure was too low to sustain human life. And my heart rate was too low. It took, they called a nurse to come in and, and they put me on an IV and gave me sugar water and um, watched me for, took a half an hour for my blood pressure to come up to normal. And then they shipped me off to surgery. <laughs> Right. Okay. So they said love is all that matters. Uh, I mean, there was so much information and knowledge in this uh, experience you have. Uh, but did you feel that also that that source is love? That's that's what we are as well. That's our core. Yes. Sources overriding character trait is unconditional love and acceptance. No judgment. It's number two character trait is curiosity. Oh, huh. so you, so you're just, you're just being source. Every time you say I'm curious, you're just showing that. You're source. <laughs> All right. And you said, and I got curious, you got to see the, the earth's, uh, past and history and also the future. Can you reveal what you saw for the, I, I mean, it's probably so much that you saw, but can you reveal a little bit about what you saw? Uh, yes, I have a list of, uh, now you have to remember this, this was in four that I saw this. So some of the things that I saw in 1994 have already happened. Uh, and okay. they're in my, a couple of my books. Um, and there's a list of the things I saw. I saw things like uh, um, the discovery of new planets. Um, I saw Mars as a green, vibrant planet in the past. Uh, and then now it looks like it does now. And I saw that whatever happened to Mars, and I don't remember now what that was, but whatever it was that took Mars out is going to destroy Earth. What? Yeah. Is that our future? But I don't remember what it is. Mm -hmm. that's, well, that's the future in like millions and millions and millions of years. But could that be in one one possibility because quantum physics shows us that there's so many possibilities that we have multiple futures multiple timelines you know this perspective <laughs> yeah that's a human that's a human way of thinking um that what i learned in the afterlife is that um everything in the physical universe is manifested moment by moment so it's always subject to change. And so the future that I saw isn't necessarily going to happen. Like one, one group of near-death experiencers from, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, all collectively agreed that Earth was going to end in 1988. Well, it didn't. I mean, that's what they saw. But because physical life is manifested moment by moment, it's always subject to change. Right. That's what kind of my point was that never, nothing is set in stone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's different than alternate futures that you can see now. It's like, nobody can predict like science can't predict, you know, quantum physics can't predict what the future is going to be because it hasn't been created yet. Yeah, that makes sense. So what you saw might happen and it might not in a way. Right. My guess is it's not going to. Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't be, you and I won't be around here to see it. So <laughs> yeah, it depends how many times I want to go back and reincarnate, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the choice is yours. All right. So 
Wow. Uh, I've, uh, I just have a few couple of questions uh, before we <laughs> wrap this up. Um, you had a council that told you that you didn't do your work enough, so you had to come back. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because uh, there is a reason why you are writing these books and being on these shows, you know? I, um, you know, at, at the end of my first afterlife experience when I was, you know, whirlwinding back, whirlwinding back into Nancy's body, you know, I was, I don't know if I was given or I chose two missions. One is to tell anybody who would listen what happened to me and what I learned in the afterlife. And two was to experience unconditional love for Nancy and Nancy's life. Mm. Well, it, for the first two years after I got back, all I wanted to do was go home. And that's all I could think about. And I wasn't suicidal or anything like that, but I just wanted to go home and I was having a really hard time adjusting to Nancy's life because nothing that I had believed before I went into the afterlife was true. And I, and I knew it was true, but I didn't know how to live it. So rather than, you know, cause trouble for my law partners, I left my law firm and I went out on my own and, you know, open my own little office, just, you know, the law firm of me, myself and I, and I practiced law and I tried to adjust and it took me about seven years, um, which I hear from researchers about average to accept what was true and to get on with life, you know, without the old beliefs that I had. And so I, that's when I started writing. Um, part of the writing exercise was to fulfill my mission, you know, to tell anyone who would listen. And part of it was to help me adjust to the new truths that I had been given. And I, my second book is called Backwards Beliefs. And that's the one that I had the hardest time with. It describes that history of earth and future earth that I saw that focused on religion. And so it was my attempt to understand how to reconcile what the Catholic church had taught me with what I learned in the afterlife. And so that's what that, that book was kind of therapy for me. Um, but it also outlines that, that whole earth history thing. Um, I didn't start telling anybody anything about it until um, my very first International Association for Near-Death Studies meeting. I showed up as a, you know, a newcomer, and the speaker for that meeting didn't show up. So when they found out I had an NDE, they said, oh, will you speak? So I, you know, I, I did my thing. That was the first time I ever told my story. And I've been telling it ever since because that's my mission. Um, I, somewhere along in there, I, I, I wasn't really telling very many people. And so I died again and I went into the afterlife and there's a, a type of afterlife experience that I call a council meeting. The, a really good example of a council meeting type of afterlife experience is Natalie Sudman's book, Application of Impossible Things, because that's what she had. I've had two of those, uh, and I've read other people that, that have had afterlife experiences that were just meetings with her council. My understanding is that if you accept a mission uh, when you leave the afterlife after an NDE, there's a group of spiritual beings that kind of watch over you, you know, monitor your mission uh, to kind of help keep you on track while well, I went on track. So my first council meeting after life experience was them telling me I wasn't working my mission and to get with the program. And even though they weren't judging me, I felt like I'd been smacked up the side of the head, you know, like, hey, girl, you know, you said you're going to do this, so get with it. Uh, so that's when I, I started um, you know, with ions and with the books and, you know, presentations and things. And then in 
uh, years later, I died a third time and went into the afterlife and met with my counsel again. It was different spiritual beings the second time. And my Nancy's mother and father were there. I saw their faces on these light beings for just a couple of seconds, but oh gosh, it was so good to see them. And then there were a bunch of other, you know, light beings, spiritual beings that, you know, I, don't, I didn't know. And there was one guy from my gym. I mean, he was in human life. He was alive, working in my gym. He was a friend of mine. He wasn't dead, but he was in the afterlife at this council meeting. And he kind of, you know, got, got one hunch up on the edge of the table that we were all around a big table. And he looked down at me, he goes, surprise. <laughs> I was surprised because it was Jeff, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, I was really being in trouble because they're calling in the field agents, you know, so that meeting, you know, they told me that uh, Nancy was dying or she'd already died and that I hadn't completed my mission. If I wanted to, I could come home. You know, there wouldn't be any judgment. I, you know, I, nobody would say anything about the fact that I hadn't completed my mission. But if I chose to stay with Nancy, we would suffer for the rest of her natural life. Hmm. So naturally, I said, oh, pick me for the suffering, you know. Um, actually, I decided, number one, I, I didn't want to fail source. I didn't want to fail my mission. And number two, I wanted to see what was going to happen. You know, I'd seen the future and I wanted to see if any of that came true. And number three, I wanted to tell those people. I wanted people to know that there's more, that there's better, that we don't have to live like the animals that humans are, that we can exercise our free will to lead happier lives that we can manifest happiness into our own lives by using our spiritual abilities we can get answers to questions by accessing universal knowledge using our spiritual abilities we can put ourselves in other people's positions and see life from their perspective and understand them and have compassion and unconditional love for them we can do all these things because we are source and if we would do them, Earth would be so much better and we would be so much happier. Hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing this and for fulfilling your mission, Nancy, because now you are. Thank you for helping. Thank wow. you for being somebody who would listen. Yeah, I, you know, I felt that I'm the one who wants to listen. And I think we, yeah. there's a lot of us who wants to listen. Thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing your story and also doing your work and not giving up on it, uh, even though it is hard. And like you said, you came back uh, and it would be more difficult for you to be in the physical body of Nancy. So, uh, yeah, an amazing, amazing job you're doing. Thank you so much. Well, Thank you, and thank you for all the good work that you're doing. Thank you.